Hi, I'm John Conway. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I lived in Fort Worth and practiced in Fort Worth for 30 years. I'm now in Houston at University of Texas, working at UT Ortho. Hi, I'm Russ Payne, a physical therapist. I've uh, been in Houston for many years, since 1991. Been involved in, in working with baseball players and, and um, actually have 10 year old now 11 year old son that I work with uh, so it's an interesting topic for me and I also work with UT physicians and I've known Dr. Conway for many years we've lectured at meetings together so we have a really good relationship I've seen a lot of his patients from long distance so uh, real happy to be here with Dr. Conway. And this is a, a great topic for me too I was a team physician for the Texas Rangers for many years I I uh, trained with Frank Job, who invented the Tommy John operation. I've had the opportunity to speak on and write on this topic many times over the years. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I think we're the one of the first questions off the bat. Um, what do little league parents need to know about the injury risks and the elbow? Yeah, I think it's uh, you know a question that a lot of people have because everyone's aware of of Tommy John injuries, Tommy John surgery. So um, I think uh, one thing that's important for people to understand is injury risk in you know little league uh, age age kids. And uh, there's a couple of things that that uh, are important there, and probably the most important thing that has been pretty much instituted is is workload or how, how many innings you pitch. Um, so that's that's something that, that we can talk about. Also, year-round baseball I think has a big effect, uh, which is kind of hard to combat because kids play spring, they play summer, and they play fall ball, and that's a year-round uh, type of activity. And when you're 12 to 14 years old, your bones are growing, uh, your ligaments and, and muscle strength may not be able to combat that. Uh, that's also an important thing. Then the other thing that is really uh, a big hard thing to combat is velocity. Everybody wants to see how hard you can throw and there's a direct relationship between velocity and UCL injury. So those are just some of the things maybe we can talk about. Some of the things that the data, the published evidence-based information out there clearly defines is that um, the difference between looking at innings and pitches is significant. If you're just counting innings, you're not going to get the pick up the stress and the low workload, and you're not going to be able to combat some of the injuries that we see. There's no question that counting pitches is more important than counting innings, counting games. But and looking at year-round play is important. It's also important to look at whether or not you're playing multiple positions on the same team, particularly catcher pitcher that's been shown to have high risk playing on multiple teams. Um, uh, many kids play with pain without reporting it. There are really good studies that show that up to 30% of the kids with documented medial epicondyle apophysitis, which is a stress injury in the growth plate, don't report their pain. They have documented injury by ultrasound and they are not reporting any pain. So those injuries are there without them having pain. Um, we also know that early specialization results in later injury. We know that the kids who stop playing other sports early have a higher risk for injury in both college and pro sports. That's been well documented. Um, we also know that every state has a different set of rules and uh, our state falls somewhere in the middle for the most part with regard to how stringent we are. But the other thing we know is that the studies have done looking at whether or not those rules are followed tend to show that despite how well parents think that their league follows the rules when the numbers are counted and somebody independent is actually looking at it, they're not anywhere near as um, uh, compliant as they think they are. So. Uh, you just have to be aware of those things. And we know that the workload, the overuse, actually does contribute a lot to the injuries that we see, not just in the Little League, but later on. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely important. Another thing that we didn't touch on is pitching mechanics. Pitching mechanics, as you get more adept and you become a pitcher, can definitely have an effect on on your elbow. What do you, what do you think about velocity? And 
Another thing, uh, Dr. Conway, people worry about is curveball or, you know, different types of pitches. Is there a difference between the fastball and a curveball on the effect of the, the ligament in your elbow? So most of the data out there right now says that the highest forces consistently come with the fastball over and over and over again. The problem with young people throwing curveballs is that they don't necessarily throw them with great mechanics. And so, yes, it's true that trying to learn a new pitch may put you at risk. But it has a lot to do with the fact that those kids trying to learn those breaking pitches are also kids who tend to be effective pitchers and they're the ones being asked to participate on the field as pitchers and we don't really know whether or not the curveball is actually contributing to the injuries like we when I have trained we all thought the curveball was a problem but no one's been able to demonstrate any of the studies have been published that the curveball is actually a risk factor. We know that good mechanics are really important and kids have a tough time throwing a fastball with good mechanics. And the harder you try to throw, the greater the forces across the elbows. So in general, you should try to get kids to learn how to throw a fastball and a change well, and delay trying to learn how to throw breaking pitches until they do those two things well. Part of the problem is that the kids that throw the hardest actually are taught to throw a curveball first. <laughs> that may have an effect on it because your gifted kid is, is just, you know, you know, throwing lights out and, he, and then he needs another pitch, maybe in the curveball is obviously the kids want to learn the curveball because most of the kids in Little League have a hard time, you know, hitting a curveball. Um, what, what's your thought about year-round baseball? And, and should we tell people that they need four months of not throwing at all? Or what, what do you think about that? So some of this data is old, but the published data says that most all throwers, and it includes the kid who plays baseball and tries to quarterback in the fall, should have three months of not throwing. <clears throat> there are some, however, who think that uh, non-competitive sub-maximal effort, meaning non-practice related, non-pitching lesson related sub-maximal effort throwing may not be detrimental and actually allow tissues to continue to see stresses that right. they need to see to remodel as they grow as opposed Shop to taking big sure. breaks off. Okay. But the but trying to establish uh, programs that kids can follow is tough and when they get to the fall typically what they have is an inconsistent program of play and practice that's interrupted by tournaments while they're also often trying to play some other sport. And I'm all for them playing some other sport. Um, I will say that football, while a great sport, sometimes does cause asymptomatic uh, during that sport injuries that become apparent during the spring season. But I mean, I still think it's important to play another sport until they get older because we know that that de decreases the risk for uh, later injuries in college and. Sport. So if you play year-round baseball and you're playing a position, is, is it different than being a pitcher playing year-round baseball? There's no question that the majority of the Tommy John operations are done in pitchers. Right. And it's a lot easier to get a position player back from Tommy John surgery than a pitcher back from Tommy John surgery. Um, and we have a relatively higher percentage of uh, this is mixed data, but probably it's easier to get a position player back with non-operative care than a position player sure. back with non a pitcher back with non-operative care. So I don't. So if you say I'm playing this, I pitch for my high school, but I don't pitch for my summer program. That sounds good, but most of those guys are still taking pitching lessons all year long, and they aren't really getting a pitching break. I think you got to look at the age too. If you're 21 to 25 year old pitcher versus a 12 to 14 year old pitcher. I think in that 12 to 14 year old for my son, I'm not letting him throw for three to four months because my son is eight out of nine on a biting scale, which is the hypermobility of someone that's extremely flexible. And this year he had some elbow pain and he's a really good pitcher, but I didn't let him pitch until he grows into his body. So I think the year-round baseball has a lot to do with your maturity and your age, too. 
uh, and increasing the tensile strength of the ligament under a gradual load, I think the, the author of, of that ultrasound study is talking primarily about professional baseball pitchers. But when you, I think you can extrapolate everything and take it from one age group to another. Um, we do know that in 11 to 12 year old kids, this is ja the studies on the Japanese baseball league programs, uh, 11 to 12 year old kids, 60% of them have ultrasound evidence of growth plate injury. Uh, and again, only two thirds of those will report having any symptoms. But we also know that the kids who have any evidence of growth plate stress in the preseason before they start the season are at much higher risk to have an actual elbow injury during the season. And so there may come a time where we can come up with a way to have preseason ultrasound assessment of some of our kids and some of the programs, particularly some of these kids where they already throw much harder. One of the risk factors for elbow injury is being bigger, throwing harder. The fact is, if you're older and you throw, if you're bigger, weigh, have more mass, and you throw harder at a younger age, it's a risk factor for a injury. Yeah, uh, my son is five seven and a half, and he just turned eleven, so he's he's in that risk area. And part of it, you know, the the size has to do with the length of your between your elbow and your middle finger. If you got a longer forearm, you've got a greater lever arm. So torque equals force times lever arm. So if you've got more torque and you've got more stress to your elbow. So I think the, 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 the answer here is to be patient with your young kids. And he's doing basketball this, this fall. And I think uh, doing multiple sports makes him a better athlete too. If you look at Major League Baseball players, most of them played multiple sports because they're gifted athletes to start with. And for them to get to the top, they had to have some period of time where they um, you know, didn't play baseball. Another question is that a lot of people have out there, if you have Tommy John elbow surgery, does that increase your ability to increase your velocity? So that, that was a myth that was dispelled, but uh, the reality is that there are coaches, parents, and players who think that if you had your ligament reconstructed, even if you were asymptomatic, and not had a, and had not had an injury that you would somehow come back from it stronger. The truth is, we don't make ligaments better than God made them. We simply are trying to restore a restraint on the inside of the elbow that can withstand the stresses that are put on the inside of the elbow. Every time you throw, you're near the tensile strength of that ligament. So, no, getting a ligament reconstruction, reconstruction does not make you a better thrower. What happens is. Many of these people who come back with better velocity and performance, and this is not true for everybody, but many of those people who do, it's because there were problems in their kinetic chain, the link between the foot and the hand, that were corrected as a part of the rehab process that allowed them to become better at their sport. It wasn't the ligament reconstruction that did that. And plus, a lot of these players had had some elbow soreness for a year, year and a half, and they got to fix. The other thing is it takes somewhere between 14 and 18 months to reach your peak performance. And we know that as a pitchers get older, they have a little bit of drop in velocity. So all those things uh, kind of factor into it. So that comment he was making is, if, you have, if you're a high school kid and you have Tommy John reconstruction surgery, it takes about, on me, about 11 months to get back to play. But it's going to be 18 months really before you're probably back to a level where you are as good. You have similar performance metrics as you had before uh, based on the data we have. At, as you move up at the big league level, it takes a mean of 18 months to get back to play. And it's probably your second season back before you have the same performance metrics. And so it's not a quick fix. Now, something has come along repair, which we do a lot in the youth, high school, and even young college player that's substantially changed the paradigm for managing ligament injuries. We now know which ones might heal on their own. We now know which ones we can repair, and we know which ones probably are better managed with reconstruction. The younger you are, the more likely 
we are to be able to repair it. The older you are, the more likely it needs to be reconstructed. If it's torn right off the bone at the top or the bottom, and you're younger, again, that leaves open the opportunity for us to do a repair. If it's shredded in the middle, again, that's the place where reconstruction, or if it's clearly been an old injury that's had a new tear through old torn tissue or damaged tissue, it's another place where we need new healthy collagen to blend into your ligament in order to get a good construct. If you're a big league pitcher, you're probably going to get a reconstruction. If you're a high school kid and the tissue's just peeled right off the bone you're, and you're not draftable, you're probably almost certainly going to get a repair. If you're draftable and you're really big, uh, it, that depends upon a lot of things. There are organizations now drafting kids who've had repairs, and so it's still a real option. The colleges are very comfortable with kids having had repairs, and there are a lot of them pitched in the College World Series. So what do you think uh, an average, just off the top of your head, I don't know if you know these numbers, of the ligament injuries to the elbow on a collateral would get a repair? So percentage-wise, I know it's going up over the years. There are a number of guys with with some big numbers out there. Uh, Jeff Dugas, uh, George Paletta. I actually have a pretty big series myself, um, and there are a number of others who are as uh, have growing experience with this as well. Buddy Savoy, some others, but the published data out there says that um, of those who have repair. Every one of those studies are better than 90% coming back, but we're cherry picking the guys that would do well. And then what percentage are getting repair is really varied some. My personal percentage is about now about 40%. When we looked at the data in 2018, it was actually 25%. It's come up since then. It's about four, maybe just under 40%. Jeff Dugas says he's somewhere just under 60%. But that means it's still for him. Somewhere between 40 and 45 percent of him, he's still reconstructing. Right now, for him, he still he has a distant referral from people for repair, and so that biases his patient population as opposed to just a community coming in saying, right. "I'm here for right. an evaluation." Right. The other thing to know is that we looked at our data in 2018: 300 um, MRI documented ligament injuries in a row and looked at what we ended up doing with them. And we did, uh, we treated 51% of them with surgery, but that meant 49% we managed on operatively. These were mostly all high school, college. They were aged 15 to 23. And of the ones that we did operate on at that time, we repaired 27% of them. Um, and uh, so back in the 90s, when I first came out, we were operating on 90% of these ligament injuries that we saw. But now we know much better which guys might heal, and which guys we could repair, and which guys we still need to reconstruct. So if, if you have a repair, what's the return to full velocity competitive throwing time frame? So <clears throat> time from surgery to toss is about two and a half to four months. And for a Time, reconstruction in comparison. Is for a reconstruction, it's four to six months. six months. For return to play as a pitcher, it's six to eight months. Some people push that down. I think six months is the earliest I'll let anybody pitch in a game. Uh, but six to eight months is a reasonable timeline to expect to be back pitching reasonably well in a game. And for a high school kid, uh, a reconstruction is a mean of 11 months for a college kid. It's probably 12 months. For a minor league player, it's about 14 months. And for a big league player, player it's 18 months. So the hesitation to do the surgery on a MLB player, what do you think that is? <clears throat> well, first off, they're older and the tissue quality is not okay. that great. So right. it's much more the likely. The tissue quality is torn, really important, right? Yeah, it's much more likely they've torn through compromised degenerative tissue as opposed to a healthy ligament that just tore off the bone. So it's not very good candidates from that. And it's probably just not tissue <clears throat> available for direct repair. There have been some examples where uh, a few pros uh, and, a, and a number of minor leaguers have had repairs and done well. And as I said, the uh, uh, organizations have begun to draft repaired players 
And so we'll see how that turns out over time. So let's talk just a minute about, uh, you know, people in rehab or returning to throw or you're just healthy and you want to throw harder. What, what's your thought on weighted balls? Because that's a real hot topic for all parents that are involved in baseball these days. So whether you're looking at really long, super long toss programs or you're looking at weighted ball programs, you have to understand that to just say those two things, there, there are an enormous number of different variations sure. of those prom, programs. One uh, lo, weighted ball program I saw was really heavy balls thrown off a mound without a lot of warm up in declining amounts, 26, 16, 12, 8, 5, and then a light ball. And I saw uh, four ligament injuries out of that organization one fall uh, in a month. And so th there are programs that are bad. If you go back to what Mike Marshall was playing with early on, and you look at some of the things that have been developed over time, Weighted balls in of themselves, working balls on a wall, working balls into a rebounder, there is a lot of value in weighted balls. But to just take a heavy ball and try to sling it as hard as you can from a knee without using any trunk, so it's an all ball stress on your ligament, uh, there is without question some problems. Now, Mike Reinhold had a nice study where they took two universities and they used weighted balls in one and not in the other. Everything else was kept the same, and what they saw was that there was an almost two mile an hour increased velocity at the expense of a 25% increased injury rate in that organization using weighted balls. So what I tell people is that not every kid benefits from a weighted ball program or, or not every weighted ball program is going to be uh, applicable to every kid. But there's no question that some kids will benefit from a weighted ball program. And the other thing is that whatever program they take on needs to be gradually introduced to them, not suddenly introduced to them. So if you take a group of kids, you have to recognize that not all of them are going to thrive underneath it, and you need to watch and make sure that you select out the kids that look like they're struggling in it. You need to introduce it slowly, and you need to make sure it's a reasonable program, because some of them are not reasonable way to run with the program. Yeah, Mike's a good friend of mine, and his study showed that there was no increase in strength between the two groups, but what he did show is they had an increase in external rotation. So that's probably something that you not necessarily want. So external rotation is what we call layback, or when you cock all the way back. So obviously if you can go further back, then you have more potential energy to throw forward. He just recently published a study that looked at the acute effects of the weighted ball program and showed that right after you throw a weighted ball, you get uh, increased external rotation. So obviously, if, you know, if your total rotation from one side to the other is even, you don't really want to increase that envelope. But I have a friend, Dr. Conway, met my friend David Evans, who's a, a pitching coach, one of the best guys in town. He uses the weighted balls for pitching instruction. I use weighted balls. We use a two-pound ball into a plow a rebounder, but we're only throwing like, you know, maybe six to eight feet, and it's used for rehabilitation purposes. So like Dr. Conway says, I think that if you use it properly, it can be a good tool, but uh, you just have to be careful with that. Uh, what about success rate after UCL reconstruction? If you have a UCL uh, surgery, are you able to get back to the same level of play? So I'd love to tell you that it's across the board 90% of high school, college, and pro athletes get back to play, but they don't. There are some studies with some pretty high we're numbers. We're talking about pitchers versus. Pitchers, yeah. yeah. I mean, pitchers. Most all position players are going to get back to play. But if you look at pitchers, the, what's important to us is, uh, do they get back to play? Do they get back to play at the same or higher level? Do they get back to play at the same or higher level at the same or better performance metrics? for a long time with limited risk for recurrent injury. That's really what we're, that's our goal in this operation. And so first thing you have to realize is that some of these guys have already had declining performance for a year or so, which affects their ability to come back because they've had loss of uh, prospect status or loss of interest from the next level up, whether it's college or whatever. And then they have this operation which takes them out of everybody's sight for a year or more 
and then they have to fight their way back because we know that first spring back and first season back is really redeveloping their their skills. <clears throat> so there's really this five year window where they've had some decline and then are climbing back to the surgery and back up. And so not everybody gets the opportunity to get back. So when we have some people who don't come back, some of it's not necessarily because their elbow didn't heal and do well, it's because they didn't really have the time built into their uh, prospect status, if you will, to make it back. The other thing is that, because, and I say that because we don't usually have a lot of elbow pain limiting us in our right. ability to get guys back. The other thing is that pitching and having high velocity is a is this magical thing. And some guys will lose their velocity without ever having an injury, and we never can figure out why they can't get their velocity back. In the same way, as a kid comes back, sometimes he's pain-free, looks great, and just for whatever reason, either the ball doesn't break the same or his velocity's not the same. Everybody's tweaking mechanics now. There's all these new concepts of where, where your arm ought to be, how we ought to be looking at trunk rotation, how we should be considering the kinetic chain from foot to hand, what should be strong, where flexibility, mobility, stability plays a role in this thing, how we actually evaluate how much glenohumeral external rotation we should have in the context of how much humor rotation we have. All these things are playing a big role in our thought process as we try to figure out how to get guys back. So in general, probably same metrics, able to play in high school, it's, it's probably reasonably high. Uh, if I'm a kid who wants to play and I have an operation and I have the opportunity to play, there's, it's a very high likelihood I'll get to come back and play. Right. <clears throat> at the next level up, if I'm at a, a big D1 school and I have this injury and I have a repair or reconstruction, again, my opportunities to return to play, provided the coach is giving me the opportunity to play, is probably pretty good, provided I don't have other unsolvable, uncorrectable kinetic chain problems. <clears throat> but when I get to the next level, that really gets tough. Minor league and major league, and at that level, it really gets more difficult to um, guarantee performance. Mid 70s, so <clears throat> 75 percent so, return to the same level. So this is what I think. Looking at all the data that's out there, I think that honestly, about 55 to 60 percent of the guys are playing two to three years out with the same performance metrics. Getting the guys back at one year, yeah, I mean 70 or even better numbers than that, 80% come back to play for some part of one year, and that's what gets published all the time. Right. But if you look at guys who are able to play in year two and three and four and are playing with a reasonable number of innings per year and reasonable performance metrics, whether it's WHIP or whatever, per year, probably those numbers, they're better than 50%. And back in Tommy John's day, they were virtually zero. Right. So there's no question it's a... It's a, it's a great operation. It saves many careers. It's extended many careers. Um, it's given kids who don't play pro sports an opportunity to go to college and play, or at least just the social networking that and interaction that they get from playing with their buddies. And some, some of these. Uh, but at the same time, it, we don't have any operations in, in my world that are 100%. Right. And sometimes the, the elbow feels great and they develop shoulder problems. That you know, is true. And, and, and some other things. And just another thing about the weighted balls is another friend of mine, Rafael Escamilla, did a study that looked at strengthening uh, and showed that you can get the same effects of a weighted ball. He took three different groups, they did three different types of strengthening, and he increased velocity two to four miles an hour. The, and Tony problem, the problem is that you have to work a little harder at that. And Tony Romeo has recently shown that yeah. underweighted balls yes. can provide the same improvement in velocity without the risk for injury. Right. Well, thank you all so much. We appreciate having you all. Any other things you want parents to know or coaches to know? Um, encourage your kids to be honest with you about how they feel. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I give a lecture and, and I give a history of what happens if the kid has pain, he doesn't tell anybody. He gets you know, a little bit more pain than telling anybody. He loses performance, he tells his coach. 
And then when he when he can't play, he tells his parents, and then he comes to see us. <laughs> so keep your pulse on your on your kids' uh, symptoms and all. Make sure they stay strong and don't overload. And uh, really, you know, keep the pitch count. Uh, make sure you hold people accountable. I have you know playing West U Little League, and we're really good about uh, both teams watching the pitch count. So I think that's important also. Thank y'all so much. No